Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patron, Phil K. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. First up today, a correction from yesterday's video. When I showed you the Tesla semi screen on the left of the driver, down at the bottom where it said the primary and secondary PSI, I, like an amateur, said it was tire pressure. It is not. Thank you to all of you who corrected me. That's actually a reading for the air brake pressure. Most semis use air brakes, and then we have cars and SUVs that actually use hydraulic brake systems. My apologies for that mistake. Tesla has filed an application to somehow add a battery manufacturing and assembly line at Fremont, the factory that's already supposed to be packed to the gills. Work location, Fremont. Applicant, Tesla. Project information, new battery manufacturing equipment line on the second floor of the main assembly building. This permit application relates to the module portion of the line. This project, not massive of course, but valued around $1.5 million. Additionally though, there's another application revealing a $1.3 million project, which would include installation of a new maintenance office, a storage area, production cells with equipment for the hood, fender and trunk lids, and offline cell manufacturing equipment. Essentially, Tesla is playing its own game of Tetris here at the Fremont factory, repositioning certain equipment, potentially for the Model S and X, kind of to make way for this new battery manufacturing line, whatever it may be. I should note, some people are interpreting this as it could be a line to make equipment to make batteries, not actual batteries themselves. As I guess you could argue this could have just said new battery manufacturing line, but instead it said battery manufacturing equipment line. Either way though, for now, Tesla not done expanding just yet at Fremont. Sawyer was at a Hertz in LA. I just wanted to point out two things. One, he said most if not all of the Model Ys had the black induction wheels, which are a $2,000 upgrade. So Hertz was fine paying that premium to get those vehicles sooner. And something to keep in mind if you're traveling in the future, it might just be this location, it might be all Hertz locations, but this one not allowing one ray rentals with a Tesla. Sawyer also shared this to his super followers. Once again, go super follow the man if you're on Twitter, he deserves it. This is from a Bloomberg terminal. Tesla may become the first auto company to have an inaugural jump into investment grade by a way of a multi-notch move, meaning moving up multiple levels at once. This all stemming from some conversations with the Raiders themselves. Additionally, they said Tesla is rapidly nearing VW's credit risk with a chance to match it within 36 months. Tesla's ratings can be as much as four notches above its BB plus ranking if the S&P changes its business risk evaluation to satisfactory from fair, a change we strongly believe can happen. Tesla's margins, profitability, and cash flow, key components, should be superior to those of Ford, GM, Stellantis, and Honda, among others that have already received the Raiders' satisfactory distinction. And what we've all been waiting for, these discussions with S&P give them confidence in their view that Tesla can move into investment grade and potentially beyond the BBB minus rating and stable outlook over the next six months. And I thought this was very interesting. Our friend Alexander has been doing some awesome work on this topic. Her Twitter will be linked below. Her research on Apple and the impact of Apple hitting an investment grade rating. Here we have Apple's stock price in the light blue. So Apple reached investment grade status around 2013 in this green bar. Now, two things. It didn't rock it up immediately, okay? It did gradually set a new all-time high after, you know, maybe a year or two. But then after that, there was a steady trend up. I think it's important to point out this run up in stock price of Apple stock, it wasn't due to a switch in profitability or anything like that, because as you can see, dating back to 2005, Apple was already profitable. As we've mentioned a few times before, Tesla achieving an investment grade credit rating will just open up the pool of investors who are actually able to invest in Tesla stock, providing a pretty nice tailwind over the coming months and years. And perhaps even more eye-opening, once again, this is from Alexandra, after Apple received its investment grade rating, 
Look at what happened to the percent of the institutional share ownership. Within about one year of the upgrade to investment grade for Apple, the institutional ownership jumped and then showed a pretty steady upgrade over the next six years or so. And we know right now that Tesla relative to the rest of the mega cap companies is one of the lowest owned stocks when it comes to institutional ownership. That's why I always say retail strong. Once again, another big tailwind for Tesla stock in the years to come if and when that investment grade credit rating does happen. Alexandra, thank you for putting this together. Now, I wanna go over these stats one more time. Nine out of 10 Americans are deficient in potassium. Seven out of 10 are deficient in calcium. Eight out of 10 are deficient in vitamin E and over half of the population is vitamin D deficient. Without certain vitamins and minerals, our bodies just can't carry out certain processes properly. This is why about a year ago, I started supplementing my wellness with Athletic Greens. AG1 is the sponsor of today's video, but as always, I only share things that have genuinely impacted my life, and shout out to Lex Friedman for the initial recommendation. AG1 has 75 vitamins, minerals, and probiotics that when taken consistently can support gut health, energy, immunity, recovery, and focus. Just drop one scoop in eight ounces of water, mix it up, and your superfood cocktail is ready to enjoy. I also add in a drop of AG1's vitamin D3 K2 as well. AG1 is also independently certified by NSF, so you know you're getting high quality ingredients. AG1 has offered to provide a year supply of vitamin D3 K2 and five travel packs free of charge with every new purchase if you use my link in the description below. So if you wanna help ensure that you're on the right side of those statistics, I think AG1 is an awesome option. The legal battle between Tesla and these dealer and auto association organizations continues. This time we're focused on Louisiana as Tesla has filed a lawsuit saying that these rules are limiting Tesla's constitutional rights. This lawsuit was filed last week. Tesla said in Louisiana, customers are still going out of state to actually buy its vehicles. And if you go to Reddit, you have the same thing happening in other states as well. These laws against direct sales started in the 1930s in the United States as auto manufacturers started using independently franchised dealerships to handle retail sales and servicing. As we know, Tesla has never had franchised independent dealers to ultimately compete against. And the Federal Trade Commission actually recommends allowing direct manufacturer sales. And there have been studies done showing this model would save consumers thousands of dollars per car transaction. Dealerships make most of their money from service and given that EVs require much less maintenance and service, this of course disincentivizes dealerships to learn and sell EVs. Tesla has long argued it cannot rely on franchise dealers to educate customers about EVs and explain the benefits of EVs. I also have to say, don't get your hopes up for any precedents being set in this Louisiana battle. Back in 2013, New Hampshire passed legislation to allow auto manufacturers with no existing franchise dealer in the state to engage in direct sales. That clearly has not served as a template for any other states. This is going to be a case-by-case -case battle strictly dependent on the leaders of each state. Another example, in Massachusetts in 2014, the Supreme Judicial Court ruled to allow Tesla to sell directly. The court ruled the law only protected franchise franchise dealers from abuse by manufacturers they're already buying from. And one last example, in Missouri, there was actually an appeals court that reversed a circuit court's decision to end direct sales, ruling the Auto Dealers Association did not have standing to sue. So there are three examples of legal battles playing out in favor of Tesla over the years, with none really impacting these battles in other states. And just to get a sense, doing some quick research, this is what I came up with with the current states that still have a total direct sales ban against Tesla. Here's the list. As you can see, some of them also ban service centers as well, which of course, as a Tesla owner, would make things unnecessarily complicated. 
Should also be noted, most of these states do currently have pending legislation that's focusing on allowing EV manufacturers to sell direct, but a lot of these bills have been defeated and some others are still pending. There's also another list around this size with states that only have partial ability to sell direct. For example, there's a few states that have a limit on how many galleries or showrooms Tesla can have per state. So just know that just because a state is not on this list doesn't mean it has unlimited authority to sell direct to consumer. This right here is firmly in the rumor category. However, I definitely think it's worth sharing. Chris Zhang saying the 2023 Model 3 and Y will remove the left and right paddles, meaning the stocks. It's going to move to a sliding gear shift like we are already seeing on the Model S and X. And the new wheel will have the touch turn signals, obviously with the stocks removed. So it's essentially going to mimic exactly what we're expecting to see in the Tesla Semi. So he's not saying it's going to a yoke. It's still gonna be a full steering wheel, but we'll be moving to the capacitive buttons. In case you're not familiar, go ahead and pause and read what the left and right stock currently allow you to control in the Model 3 and the Y. Here's a look at what could possibly be coming to the Model 3 and Y next year. Now, many people have suggested it would be much better to have the left turn button on the left hand side and the right turn signal indicator on the right hand side to make it much more user friendly. But I would say that seems unlikely because Tesla likes to streamline production, keeping things the same across vehicle models where it can. This would undoubtedly be a polarizing decision, but let me know which side you guys would fall on if this does indeed happen. And somewhat related, last summer Elon said auto detect direction for the shifter will come as an optional setting to all cars with FSD, seemingly including Model 3 and Y. We mentioned this last week, but I wanted to show you a new screenshot of this new feature where you can view the last measured tire pressure now in the mobile app. Under the heading controls in the app, you can see the last measured tire pressure for each wheel. And for the future, where there's a lot more car sharing and fleet management, the kilowatt said, these cloud driver profiles basically do not sleep on them. This is huge for fleet managers and our guests who oftentimes drive Teslas at home. It's like a hotel room that knows how you like your coffee and automatically brews it for you. To be able to get into any Tesla and have all of your settings auto-populate is an awesome feature. And of course, having custom profiles for different use cases. Lucid has filed for a new mixed shelf offering to potentially, over the next few years, raise around $8 billion in different stages, and the amounts would be determined at a later date. So this does not mean Lucid is raising money right now. It's basically just setting the stage to do so in the coming years. With this mixed shelf offering, it'll give Lucid some flexibility in what type of securities it decides to sell and ultimately how dilutive this $8 billion potentially that it will raise could be as it's currently sitting around a market cap of around 27 billion. These shelf offerings give the issuer three years to raise the capital rather than having to raise it all at once. I wanna give you some context here. So Tesla did of course raise capital in the first few years after IPO. So let's just say the first six or so years, Tesla raised around $5.2 billion. Now at that time, Tesla's cumulative global sales had passed 250,000 in September of 2017. So within about a year of the last capital raise we have here on the screen. Now for comparison, Lucid has raised around $6 billion without this potential new $8 billion offering and so far has delivered around 1,000 cars. So of course, this isn't a perfect apples to apples comparison. Lucid built its first factory. Tesla really took over its first factory in Fremont. Either way though, it still highlights Tesla's insane manufacturing and CapEx efficiency and cost control over the years. Just to show you, Lucid has raised around $6.8 billion across seven different funding rounds, a majority over 6 billion of this occurring over the last five or so years. So Bradford Ferguson held a Twitter space today and he talked to somebody that apparently was involved with coming up with the terms and how this new advanced manufacturing tax credit 
the $35 per kilowatt hour and the 10 per kilowatt hour for the module assembly for how that's going to work. The short of it, it looks like Tesla may be receiving all of this even with its partnership at Giga Nevada where Panasonic is making the cells due to an agreement that Tesla created back in 2020. New agreement states that it's for credits and customs. It says credits or benefits related to taxes and export import duties re resulting from the contract between Tesla and Panasonic, including trade credits, export credits, or the rights to the refund of duties, taxes, or fees belong to Tesla. Here's the document, terms and conditions for the Gigafactory between Tesla and Panasonic, AKA Giga Nevada. I just wanted to show you Bradford's not out here making this up. Here it is in the document, what he just read, but it goes further. Basically, Tesla will keep the documents that will be necessary to permit Tesla to receive these benefits or credits. So if this is true, that means as soon as 2023, Tesla could be receiving around $1.5 billion in these tax credits. Giga Nevada is currently between 35 and 40 gigawatt hours per year. So if Tesla were to receive $45 per kilowatt hour, 35 for the battery, 10 for the cell module assembly, that's around $1.5 billion. So stay tuned for more on this, but the impact on this, if this indeed is accurate, cannot be overstated. That would be just for Giga Nevada, nothing from Cato Road, nothing from Giga Texas, and that's nothing to do with the EV tax credits to $7,500 per vehicle. Looks like there's a class action lawsuit coming Tesla's way over phantom braking. This coming from a California Model 3 owner, Jose Alvarez Toledo, saying this is causing a frightening and a dangerous nightmare. The lawsuit seeks compensatory and punitive damages for expenses to repair vehicles, diminished value of Tesla cars, and for a refund of the added cost attributed to the autopilot feature. Now, is this phantom braking jarring and can it cause you a little heart skip? Absolutely, if you've never had it happen to you. However, does it warrant a class action and punitive damages? I guess that's what we have the legal system to ultimately decide. And so we don't have to end today's video on that note from Veda Prime, the seventh Australian Tesla ship has arrived. Many thousands of Teslas have arrived in Australia this quarter. Records have been smashed. That'll do it for today. Please like the video if you did. Don't forget, check out AG1 linked below to get your freebies. Hope you all have a wonderful day and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.